So today, I want to look at the Ica Stones hoax or history. Now, in National Geographic, it says no human being has ever seen a dinosaur. Now, do they know that or they think that? They don't know that, they think that. You don't know what you don't know. If you knew what you didn't know, you would know it. But you don't know what you don't know. And as a pastor, I always divided things into fact, feeling, and fiction. When people would talk to me, is that a fact or is it a feeling or is it a fiction? It is something you feel you turned into what you think is a fact, but it's fiction. They don't know that. They're just thinking that. So it is fiction. Evolutionists say dinosaurs didn't live to, with man. Any evidence that dinosaurs and man lived together would destroy evolution. Carl Sagan, in his book, The Dragons of Eden, he tried to account for the dragon legends in many, many countries around the world. And what he said is it came up from primitive mouse brains through evolutionary ladder and popped out of the uh, man's memory. Um, now, who says scientists don't believe in miracles? You've got two courses of action here. How did ancient people know about dinosaurs? We inherited images from mouse brains. Or man saw living, breathing dinosaurs. There's a dinosaur. Whoops. A mouse saw it. So it, it went up the evolutionary chain through 65 million years and popped out of some African Bushman's brain and he did some petroglyph drawings of dinosaurs. Or somebody saw a living dinosaur. When solid scientific evidence is presented, evolutionists always evoke some mystical, magical uh, mechanism to, that defies description. I'm committed to the return of common sense. And when you give this evidence, paleontologists pale, and it sends them scampering as their flimsy ladder of time collapses beneath an avalanche of evidence. What would happen if, evolution, uh, if dinosaurs and men lived together? Evolution would be dead on arrival. It would melt down faster than the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. Uh, it would be a pedestal-smashing blow for evolution. So let's prepare to believe. But I'm going to approach today the Ica Stones uh, down in Peru. This is Dr. Javier Cabrera. I knew him for a number of years. He died in 2002. That's him standing there. And in 1961, <clears throat> a stone was given to him by Felix Lamarle, and it was a, a stone engraved on it was an ancient fish. Now, in that, in that aspect, he began to collect many of these stones. Uh, I, I, as I said, I knew him. He died in 2002. When I first visited with him, he showed me it was a big stone he gave to uh, the Queen of England. He gave another big stone to the Queen of Sweden. He gave a stone to the New Age or Shirley MacLaine. And I said to him, you haven't given a stone to the Queen of Beaverton. And he said, who's the Queen of Beaverton? I said, my wife. And he said, by all means, she should have a stone. So that's how I collected the first stone, and it had a, a, a two dinosaurs on that stone. So how do we account for these mysterious Ica stones? <clears throat> There's about several, several thousands in this collection. And uh, I have photographs of every one of the stones, so many thousands and thousands of them. Uh, it's a misnomer to think that he's the only person that had these stones or that he's the mastermind behind the making of the stones. He was a medical doctor. He did uh, teach at Gonzaga, uh, Gonzaga's, Gonzaga University in Ica, Peru. Uh, as I back up here one second, I wanted to show, the, you see the portrait behind him, this right here. That's his ancestor, Dom Pedro, uh, who settled, he was a conquistador, and he settled uh, Ica in 1571. Ica is named for the Indians who lived there, not the Inca, I-N-C-A, but the Ica Indians. So on these stones, 
uh, there are many dinosaurs, thousands of them. And here's a man riding a dinosaur, a sauropod. Here's another stone with various dinosaurs on them. And this stone that has frills on the back of the dinosaur, and it looks like a blanket uh, that you might put on a camel. So in 1535, Father Simeon was traveling with the conquistador Pizarro, and he came to that region and he saw the engraved stones. In 1562, some of these stones were sent back to Spain. 1571, the Spanish chronicler Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacute wrote about these stones. And there's two of these books. Uh, one of them is in the National Library in Lima, Peru. And, and I've had translations done. And he does talk about these engraved stones. And some of them, what we would call dragons. In 1906, Don Pedro, which was his, not the conquistador, but his great grandfather, they found stones in tombs in the region. Also, while they were plowing fields, they found some stones. Farmers today still find them sometimes when they're plowing, and they come across some tombs, and they will find the open tombs and when their plow breaks through, and they will see. 1941, famous Peruvian archaeologist Jose Tello finds a stone with, with strange animals in grave. He was the, he's the greatest uh, archaeologist of Peru of all time and he talks about it. So in 1955, Carlos and Pablo, Sal Pablo Salte, they lived out in Okahaje, which is a very interesting place, Okahaje. Uh, in that desert, they find giant uh, whale skeletons. I've looked for those, I've been out there. And they also found a fossil penguin that was almost six feet tall. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, but uh, lots of things in the fossil record. But they, they collected stones. They were wealthy plantation owners. They had a winery out there. And some of these stones went to the Ica Regional Museum in Ica. And that collection was divided up. There was hundreds and hundreds of them. Some of them have been found in official archaeological excavations. But 122 of those are still left in the Ica Regional Museum. And one of those stones has a pterosaur on, engraved on it. In 1955 to 56, Commander Elias uh, acquired stones from various tombs, and those are in the, they were in the uh, Naval Museum. 1961, there was a flooding of the Eagle River, and when the Eagle River flooded, there were many eyewitnesses that as it broke through this area, they, there was a big burial, and they found lots of these stones. Um, and they were engraved. Felix Lazar, uh, this Romero gave an engraved stone of an extinct fish. 1966, Javier Cabrera begins the collection of stones. 1967, archaeologist uh, Certo, he was the second most famous archaeologist of all time. He did an independent excav uh, excavation, and he went out to Okahaje in what was the old Max Yule tombs system, and while he was excavating there, he found some stones in the tomb. One of them was of a five-toed llama, it was supposed to be extinct five million years ago, or 50 million years ago. And on top of that, he found other engraved stones. And this was an official archaeological excavation. In 2001, a stone was found in Nazca Tome uh, on the periphery of the Nazca Lines in, near the Rio Grande drainage system, a small stream that came along there in an ancient field um, which was a tomb which was once used for raising crops by the, by the uh, Nazcan Indians, but in the area where there was tombs, they found a stone. And I was involved in some of that. So this is Alejandro Pez Acerto. He was the director also of the Ica Regional Museum. When I went there to inquire about the stones, they told me the man didn't exist. See, there's a cover-up that goes on in these things because it's a career-threatening injury if you say that there's stones with dinosaurs on them. That includes not only with secular archaeologists, that includes creationists. Creationists, the most of them have already made up their minds that these things are fakes or they are clever uh, tourist trinkets or there's some other explanation of them, but they're certainly not 
uh, real. They don't believe that. The major and I, I'm, just, I'm being candid with you about this, okay? So I'm giving you evidence, and you decide for yourself. So while I was looking there, and they say he never was, the director of the museum, I looked up above her desk, and I said, oh, is this the book you don't have? <laughs> so I had to go to the highest officials in the region to get permission to go in the Eco Region Museum upstairs, and uh, we filmed and photographed most of the stones that were found in official archaeological excavations and some from Carlos and Pablo Soldi out in Okahaje. So this is his book, and I have a copy of it. This is the five-toed llama he found in the tomb. Now, e even if you look at the websites, and recently, again, one of the major creationist organizations uh, just put on their website that the person who carved these is Basilio Yuchua. I, and, and Irma Guth, they didn't mention Irma, but I knew Basilio. He died in 2005. I knew him for a long time. And he never, he lived, in, he lived with his family in a little hovel. It's just beyond poverty. And, and a little room, one room, dirt floor, doesn't have a roof. It doesn't rain there, so he didn't need a roof, I guess. But so poor, so terribly poor. And in 2002, I was with my wife, and we, we drove up in a rental car. And I always brought gifts to them. They never knew when it was going to come because they didn't have phones or anything. So I arrived, and I asked him, I said, Basilio, could you take me out to one of the tomb areas, the Max Yule Cemetery? So he got in. We drove him out there, and we went outside to Okahaje. And then I climbed up on these mounds. And as we were looking through the ancient cemetery, there was a tomb that had collapsed. And when we came over to that tomb, and we looked down inside, there was a stone, an engraved stone. That just had several drawings on it of, of markings and, and things. It did not have any animals or dinosaurs. But uh, that proved, that was one of the times that, uh, and let me also say, I was with National Geographic in 2001, and National Geographic was filming with me. Is this of interest to you? Is everybody awake out there? Oh, uh -huh. so National Geographic, and we flew over the Nazca Lines, and and I talked about some of the discoveries there, and, and, and there are many things that happened. But I also hired some waqueros. They're grave robbers. And uh, so we went out outside of, uh, which is the Chincha Inca Indians, where there great, there's a cemetery up above the dunes that, that people didn't know about it, but these grave robbers. And we were there, and they were filming. They go through their ancient rituals. All of the people I know, even most of them who profess to be Christians, still worship their ancient gods, uh, Pachimama and the, 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 the hummingbird, all the different Inca gods and Nazca gods. They still worship those. They accept Christ, but they still worship Disney. But these people went through their rituals, and then they began to dig, and they take massive amounts of pisco sour and stuff, and they first do these plunger things, these round, they have handles, and they're about six feet. Uh, and what happens when these tombs are built, at the top of them they put, uh, it's called barraca wood, there's wood that goes across the top. So the sand covers about six feet, and they look, and then they plunge through like this with this big long metal tube, and when it hits, it, they hit the top of the wood, and they just dig so fast, they look like uh, moles digging into the ground at night. And then when you break into the tomb, uh, it's, it's like somebody had died weeks earlier. It's, a, it's such a massive thing that you, they take lots and lots of uh, aspirin. And while we were filming for National Geographic, in one of the tombs we found an engraved stone. Uh, so that kind of ruined my deal with National Geographic because they're never going to show that. It never got put on TV. So Basilio, he, people said, oh, look, he, he carved all these. Now, one time he said he did carve some. Now, let me give you the, dis, the dis, distinction between Basilio stones, a stone from a tomb, and a stone from Cabrera's Museum. Basilio used a hacksaw, he used hacksaw blades, blue hacksaw blades. And when you break through the surface of an andesite rock, like that, 
it cuts through the surface, and so there's feldspar and quartz, and it'll have a glint back to it. Also, you can see there's no patina, and you will find under high-powered microscopes little pieces of the, the blue. Then I have a stone from Cabrera's Museum, and then I have a stone that I'll talk about a little bit more. This stone was found by a Certo Pizarro, a Certo in 2001. And this was found in an official archaeological excavation, and it has two dinosaurs on it, this stone right here. It has a massive amount of patina all over it. Also has saltpeter on the top of it, which is almost unheard for these kinds of tombs to have uh, this much accumulation of, of patina and everything on the stone. So I took these stones, and we'll talk more about it in a second, but these laboratories, we took them to various laboratories, and um, we just a blind test. And so they take, and they always detect immediately, Basilio's is a fake because it has a fresh carving. And the others, it has some patina. And then the next one, you'd see this so heavily coated and everything. And I'll get into that a little bit deeper. So here's one of the tombs, and here's a dinosaur stone right here, and here's a mummy. The tombs are about six, about eight feet deep, and they did a combinations of things when they buried their dead. They would line the walls with these river stones, or they made big clay blocks, or they used other type stones and put it all together. So it's about eight feet tall, and then they put the wood on top, and then the sand about three feet deep. So this is a microscopic analysis. If you'll see, you see the patina here in the grooves of this stone, this dinosaur stone right here? And another interesting thing about this, even if it's some dirt in it, the feel, if you take any stone, I don't care, you go to the remotest regions of deserts today, and if you find a stone on top of the earth, and you take it to a library, a, 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 a laboratory under high-powered microscopes and other analysis, you will always find little bits of polycarbons or residue of some fabric or something. You'll find something that has contaminated the stone. But when you get one out of the tomb fresh, there's no contamination. So if you protect it correctly and get it to a laboratory, and uh, one of the laboratories that took it to, he was amazed that they couldn't find anything of this kind of contamination in it. So it also had patina in it. So laboratory tests, uh, the Mauricio Hanshaw Mining Company of Lima, Peru, authentication 1968. 1969, University of Bonn, Germany, authentication. 1973, NASA scientist Joseph Blumrich. 1976, Ryan Drum. And by the way, can I ask myself a question? Is it okay? Why isn't this published in any science journals, Pastor Swift, Mr. Know a Few Things? Oh, glad you asked it. Because the Gestapo is everywhere. Once you start an organization, you're going to be protective. And there's good reasons for that, okay? All right. I, I was with the KGB in Russia, SSI uh, in Turkmenistan, Afghanistan. Kajikistan, near Stan the Man, Cheapistan. And in America, they have the FBI. I mean, I don't know. Just, just something about alphabet groups, and I respect them, okay? But there will be an article that's published in the next edition. It's coming out in a month or two in the Journal of Creation, David Watts on myself. And some of these things have been there. So, so, so get that, and that answers my question. It is coming out. 1977, Eric Van Donneken, he did microscopic analysis. 2000, Mason Optical Laboratories, Portland, Oregon, did analysis, three, the blind test of three stones. 2001, Palm Abrasive Laboratories, they did analysis. Also, they do aircraft parts. They do testing within something like one millionth of an inch. It's extreme how close they try to do different things with microscopes. And they did testings of the stones. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, Neil Steedy also did tests. Uh, and what he did, he tried to debunk them, and he took a stone, and it had 
the, the, in Okahahe, there's also tar pits, and some of the stones they put on the outside, the black is tar. And he took samples, and he said, I'm, I'm going I'm to show this dinosaur stone is fake. But when he did that, he found wood samples inside, and it dated to about 2,000 years ago. So he didn't want to publish the results. Uh, Palm Abrasive Laboratories, 2004 laser optical USB digital microscope. You ever see those USB digital, digital microscopes? I have one, Proscopes. You take them like that, you, heck them, you, heck, uh, you connect them to a computer, and they, they use them in, like if you watch uh, some of the crime movies, uh, crime series on TV, you'll see them use that. Police in some departments use it. And they're, they're made in Westland, Oregon. And I have one of those, and I took it down to the Capera Museum, and I had the skept skeptic select stones. It's had some believer select stones and independent people select stones. And so we did USB optical microscope analysis that connects to a computer and is about this big, and it magnifies from 10 to 100x, and it takes pictures of the stones. And what it showed is the stones had patina in the grooves, and there was no evidence of the use of hex hexaws or other metallic particles in the, in the thing. And also in laboratory, 2014, Chem Optics Labs in Westland, Oregon. Um, and in this test, they also found residue of ancient instruments. Now, the process of these ancient instruments, they used to carve stones, the little flakings inside underneath the patina, some of that oxidization was there and it's a combination of copper and tin, a small amount of tin. And this was developed about seven to 900 AD metallurgically. And again, look up that article that's coming out and you will see it. Okay, stone collections. There's, there's an Iki Museum, Peruvian Aeronautical Museum. There were over 50 until I got involved and they have heavy patina on them and some of them are the dinosaurs. But once, and they published an article in magazines and and journals down in Peru, but once the spotlight came on the museum, those 50 plus stones have now disappeared, except for one in an area where there uh, is also some other collection of artifacts. But all the other stones have disappeared. So that, that part of it is uh, gone. Uh, the Kaleo Naval Museum has some, the Nazca Museum has a large one, the Papa Museum, which is in, up above, uh, Nazca, about 45 miles away, and there are many private collections of these stones. All right, so let's look at Ica stones. If you were to go back to the 1960s, 1970s, probably even early 1980s, how did they depict dinosaurs as lumbering, behemoths, dragging their tails, right? I have many, many dinosaur books now from that era, and that's the way they drew dinosaurs, because that's what they believed. They dragged their tails, and they were big and lumbering. It is known that dinosaurs were lumbering, slow-moving, tail-dragging, behemoths. Dinosaurs were droopy-tailed. The Ica stones with dinosaurs walking with tails sticking out proves they are fakes. Now, that's written in the 1960s. Okay, all right, they're fakes. So here's a stone. You see some dermal spines on the back, frills, cross-hatching, walking with his tail sticking out. Obviously a fake. Here is skin. I had one of the best pieces of preserved dinosaur skin ever found. I got it in Bolivia in 1997, and then I gave it away to Carl Ball and his museum. Uh, I miss it, but it was a gigantic piece. Uh, well, it's about this big. Uh, a fossilized dinosaur skin. But if you look closely on the Ica stones, there are many of these patterns. It looks like, and also, we know now, dinosaurs had this kind of round, bubbly type it's on the stones. Here we have dermal frills on these dinosaurs from the 1950s, 1960s in the collection. Dinosaurs on the Ica stones are comical creations. Sauropod dinosaurs did not have funny fish frills running along their spines. They are fanciful products of human imagination. That's what scientists used to say about it. Yeah. Gotcha. The Ica stones are science fiction. They belong in a movie, not a museum. Mm, dermal spines. 
1992, Stephen Zirkus, uh, volume 21 uh, in um, geology. He, with the Hal Corey, they found fossilized dinosaur skin. And among that, they found evidence that dinosaurs had dermal frills in the back, similar to the scoots on the back of crocodiles. And iguanas, the frills on the back. Dinosaurs had those frills. Before that, all dinosaurs were smooth skinned. But the ecostones had dermal, so dermal frills. Oh, well, they're fakes. Uh, conical or spirit spine like dermal scoots, neck, back, and tail of the dinosaur. There's December, pages 1061 and following. Here's the dermal spines. The ecostones are dead on accurate with a precise pattern or ornamental dermal spine on the tail and anteriorly along the body and neck. I don't say that, but my book is kind of a cult classic. I think it sold maybe five copies. But <laughs> no, I sold a few, but there are evolutionist paleontologists who have my book. And sometimes they contact me and they'll make comments like this. But they don't want me to, all of them, for me to say their name publicly because they'd lose their jobs. But they're pointing out some of the accuracies of these stones. Michael Milburn. So see this on the back of this stone. I'm just looking at one of the stones. With a, with a, this, although culturally stylized, the Ica dinosaur seems to be putting the correct texturing on the sauropod dermal spine. Did I write that? No. Lawrence Whitmar, who is at the Smithsonian Institute, sent me that email about a year and a half ago. And he's the one that's pointing out that this is correct. Not El Swifto from Beaverton. Okay. Dinosaurs walking with tails are dead on right. Now, so other people said, no, it's some kind of iguana. Well, I looked at 24 dinosaur experts, museums. I even sent some things to people like David Gillette, and, and he thought I was just making some things. And he said, well, that, that, that's correct. Even those big things, the round things on there, uh, he's an expert in dinosaurs. He's now at Northern Arizona University. And he said, you know, some of these dinosaurs, they had skin patterns. That, that some of them would be about the size of a dinner plate, they think, from what they could find in skin impressions. And he says, this is accurate. And then he hung up on me after I told him it was ecostone. Okay. Dinosaurs had smooth, leathery skin, much like elephants. They were devoid of any ornamentation. So Barnum Brown said that back in the 1960s, 1970s, about the ecostones, that they're incorrect. Well, now, he know, now we know he was incorrect. And some of the creationists I knew back then, they're incorrect too, because they said that the ecostones were fakes. No serious paleontologist gives credence to the ecostones showing Dinosaurs with bumpy, scaly skin or rosetta skin patterns. Hmm, okay. But now we know it's just the opposite. So we see here on this stone fossil dinosaur skin with bumpy nodules. We see some rosetta type patterns. We see the large things. And this is on many of the Ica stones. I'm just using an example. Now here's the Ica stone here. And here's a Nazca vase with some Tiananmen influence about uh, 700 AD, which I now own this vase. So the attack was that this dinosaur on it was an iguana. But look, iguanas don't have long necks. You see the long neck on it right there? And the type of dermal frills that are there. So sometimes made a mistake. So others said somebody made a mistake and put a dinosaur on, on it. Well, it's a, it's a dinosaur. This is in the National Museum of Bolivia in um, uh, La Paz. You know, I got out of an airplane at 13,000 feet without a parachute. Super parachute, yeah, because that's how high the airport was. When the plane landed, I got out. But, uh, and then we went into, uh, uh, and uh, I'm working with the National Air and, uh, Air Ecological Museum there to get it. But this was found in an excavation at Tiwanaku, and it's, uh, they don't know exactly what it is, but it's two gold. Do those look like dinosaurs? Okay. The old concept was that dinosaurs dragged their tails. Now we know 
from dinosaur track rays and study of their anatomy that they raise their tails. And tails are best put where they belong, in the air. Now that's a current dinosaur book. Dinosaur past and present, Everett Olson, okay. Now, remember T-Rex from the old days in the books? And he's got his arms like this backwards and stuff. Um, this is a 1960s dinosaur drawing. More correct anatomically than that. They used to put sprawl leg diplodocus. This is from the 1920s. But the problem was, if their legs sprawled out like that, they'd drag their belly. They had many problems. So if they were copying these, these things, why wouldn't they do it that way? Well, instead, they have it like this, upright. Dinosaur noses. You know, everybody makes mistakes, even God. Take your nose, for instance. Who would put that upside drippy thing over your face? If the sanitation department were to inspect it, they'd give you 15 days to have it fixed or to move it. But where could you move it to? If you moved it down here by your navel, every time you sneeze, your shirt would fly open. If you moved back there, when you sat down, you would suffocate. So maybe God knows best after all. I was thinking living here in Oregon, if your nose turned upside down, what would you do? <laughs> You know, you'd drown. Or how would you kiss somebody? Okay. All right. What if your ears were on your, uh, your nose was out here and you had an ear right here? And by the way, if you came from outer space and there were no humans left and they found a skeleton, how would they know what to do with your nose? They wouldn't even know you had a nose, would they? Because there's just a hole right there, right? So when you find dinosaur stuff, where do you put noses? You want to be nosy? Until 2001, dinosaur nostrils were placed toward the back of the head because scientists believed large dinosaurs were aquatic. You know, they had snorkel snouts, like submarine periscopes, but their noses were up here. Some of the dinosaurs is up to 30 inches, the length of their nostrils up here, the, the nasal cavity. So where would you put it? Larry Whitmer, his study points new picture of dinosaur nose in Science August 2003. It first came out in 2001. Well, all kinds of science uh, and medical things, and you know, they use all kinds of equipment and evaluation. And they found that the, the dinosaur noses don't belong further up, but towards closer to the front. Uh, nasal passages positioned further back would be like a snorkel, okay? Actual studies by Whitmark demonstrated they were close to the front of the face near the mouth. Now here's, here's pictures from the 1980s, 1990s. See why they had these big behemoth beasts in water? Because they were so bulky, they spent most of their time in the water, and they would put their noses further up here. See, up towards the top. Brachiosaurus had nostrils on the top of his head. So this is like a two, 2,000 year, two, about year 2,000 book. So, okay. For over 100 years, these paleontologists put them there. Here's revealed dinosaurs in 2003. Where did they put the snout, I mean the nostrils? Right up further. Some textbooks still do the same thing. Dennis Swift, you're a pastor over there in Beaverton, Oregon. What do you really know? Come on. Last year, I couldn't even spell preacher, now R1. Okay. Well, this is not me that says this. You know who sent that to me? Lawrence Whitmer, the guy who knows the most. And he says, he points, this is his, this is his, and he put this, eco burial stone depicts sauropod nasal placement correctly. The number one export on noses in the world. Now, I have that stone, so we can look at it afterwards. And here it is. And here's the dinosaur with dermal spines. And here's the patina. And all this is on the stone, heavy weatherization and saltpeter together. But you can see the nostrils right there. 
And you have to be careful in the right light to photograph this, otherwise you can't see some of the things on it. Are we still doing okay out there? So, there it is. Thank you, Lawrence. A potosaurus. Remember the potosaurus had the, they put the, uh, the wrong head, they put a camosaurus head on the skeleton of the apatosaurus, and that was the way until the 1980s, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. Well, here's an uh, Ica stone with the correct head on it, the apatosaurus head, not a camosaurus head. There's a camosaurus, big skull, toothy. What is that? A tri How many says that's a triceratops? God. In every textbook, every country, every place in the world, no matter what language, what level, coloring book, just a book about a, dinosaurs or complex textbooks, all say triceratops had three horns. So I like to invent words. Did the triceratops have three horns or five horns? Three horns, right? Okay, okay. I call it cincoceratops. Oh, okay. See this stone, Ica stone? The first time we photo filmed this was 1996 with Don Patton. So this guy, I have to leave him compassionately anonymous because I don't want him to lose his job. He spent 30 years plus studying triceratops. He's seen more skin and everything else of triceratops than anybody else. But you see this? There's one horn, two horn, three horn. Oh, here's a horn down here. And look at this, this kind of stuff on the back here. And here's something else over here. Pastor, you said cincoceratops. What is that sticking out of its mouth? So what would you name it if it had six horns? Hmm, okay. So here is the right here. See this right here? That's called um, the side of it is epijugal. It's a, a crest or epahuga. You see this right here? There's only two of these that, re that they have in the world. One of them is in the Smithsonian, and it's the best. And the guy, when he saw the stone, then he went back through collections, and he was, he'd been studying this for 30 years, and he contacted me, and he said, wow, your Ica stone is anatomically correct. All the textbooks in the world are wrong, because we found two now that were very well preserved and all the others broke off during fossilization. So see the epijugal horn right here? Oh, yes. And the section of the triceratops, there's frill that shows serrated ridges right in here. And it was kind of a keratin, they think, type material there, and it comes along. And I'll get to this in a second, but you see, in 2007, they found the best preserved one and it has a horn sticking out of its mouth. Hmm. And I used to be around buffaloes in New Mexico. How many buffalo do you think there were in 1871 when the Transcontinental Radio, uh, uh, Railroad connected in America and the buffalo hunters went after them? One herd in Kansas stretched for over 50 miles and was 20 plus miles wide, and they estimated in that herd there were 20 million of them. The biggest herd in America, they had dozens of people trying to count them. It stretched for about 150 miles, and it was 70-something miles wide, 100-plus miles long, and they estimated over 100 million buffalo just in those herds. How many of you have been up close to a buffalo? Uh, my mom lived in Monument, New Mexico, and there was a buffalo wallow there where the Indians used to hunt, and there's a few buffaloes around there. So, then from 1868 to 1881, just one processing plant, when they turned buffalo skeletons into fertilizer in Kansas, they did over 31 million buffalo skeletons just at that one plant. And yet if you go out and study these petroglyphs, and I've seen, you know, I'm part of a team, I haven't seen 8 million plus, but we've cataloged more than 8 million petroglyphs. There's only four of them 
in all the world that have buffaloes on them. And yet there were so many buffaloes. And there's a few that we found and, uh, that have dinosaurs. Okay. So here's the epigenetic. Here's what he said to me. Dr. Swift, thank you. Uh, the Ecoceratopsian stone carving appears to be the showing of the true extended of the epigenetic horn that adorned the cheek of the Triceratops. And he goes on to tell me all this. I have studied the Ceratops for 30 years. I was asked by the Smithsonian in 1988 to consult on their Triceratops remount and came across the skull cheek fragment. It is the best preserved cheek crest that we have. And he wants to write a book with me. And um, so then we'll, he thinks that'll kind of end his career. Because uh, if you write with a creationist, that's, a, that's, a, that's trouble. Uh, see this right here? There's the horn, best preserved cheek thing. Now this is right here is a horn that comes out of the mouth region right here. And it's right here. And they're not sure how that forms, like, like a horn on a, on, a, on a bull or something. This found in 2007. So these are the ridges along. This is the Ica stone here with these ridges. And here's the best preserved. And it has the same serrations along here. So he talked about the frill. It is believed that the frill of the triceratops may not have been covered in skin, but rather a keratosis, keratosis, keratosis uh, sheath, keratin. This is the late tri 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 triceratops I found in 2001. This is the best preserved triceratops skin, synchoceratops. And you see the bumps and ridges and a ridge along the top. So as the Ica stone shows, a covering would have been needed if the animal was to be ridden upon as the beast of burden. See those ridges and bumps? Once again, you have to be close to an animal to see that. So Triceratops is presented like this, not sprawled out. That used to be the textbooks. This is the skin right here of a Triceratops. Cassowary bird. Is dinosaur skin more like birds or is it more like reptiles? Well, reptiles, you know, it overlaps like snake skin and all that. And the best birds, like a cassowary and other birds that have the best skin examples, and all birds, it doesn't overlap. It's octagonal, polygon, like the triceratops. So this is a cassowary bird. See the way his feet are and see the scales? The skin cover. Snake skin overlaps. Bird scales are polygonal, octagonal, and never overlap. Snake scales overlap. Dinosaur fossil skin has avian features. I didn't say they were birds. I didn't say they came from birds. I just said their skin is similar to that. It doesn't resemble reptilian skin. Creationists don't get the privilege to look directly at all this stuff that the evolutionists do. They're going to draw some wrong conclusions. But the fact is, it does look like bird skin. But that doesn't mean it's a common designer. So again, overlapping. This, this is uh, camels. See the camel? See, when it's the regular weather, a camel's nostrils are like this. But when it's a windstorm, it can close its nostrils. You excited? Wow. I've ridden camels all over the desert of Egypt. So here's his breathing. You know, when it's wind, closed, more closed. You have to get up very close to see that, don't you? Or be around them. What kind of camel is that? D for dromedary, D, one hump, bacterian, two humps. Are those water deposits or fat deposits? What? Hello? Fat. So they also, they can 
live off of the fat and drain one hump, then drain the other hump. You have to be close to them to see those things. They have to be around them to know. On the south side of the, well, the famous Tyrannosaurus Max, another lesson. In the 1960s, the stones were considered to be the inaccurate cartoon-like creations. The people who made them just didn't know anything about dinosaur anatomy. Today, scientists, scholars, dinosaur experts, and creationists say they are too correct. Why, if you don't study the 60s and 70s and don't know about the collection from then, how can you leap to now and say you know something about them? Most all of them just go to Basilio Yachua which he did make a few, and there were copies, and he was afraid, too, because uh, in, in, in Peru, if you, you're caught for that, you say something's real, you're going to prison. And prison's not like here where you get a TV and, and you know, order your meals out and whatever. Uh, in Peru, it's like a death sentence. In some of the places, if you get any food, it's because your family's wealthy and somebody will come and throw some food or trash, trashy stuff, vegetables and things over the top of the prison walls. Uh, for people to have, but otherwise you, you, you starve to death in, in Peru in a prison. So that's why he was afraid. Okay, Nazca, Peru. All of these stones are found mainly in the Atacama Desert, which is about a thousand miles in length. It's the driest desert on the planet. Uh, many places they don't have measurable moisture. But there's the archaeological enigmas, the Nazca lines. It is one of archaeological's most baffling enigmas, built from 300 BC to about 800 AD. And um, they use the uh, desert as a gigantic etch -a sketch and they, the earth's crust as a kind of a canvas to create art. And there's these uh, dinosaur, these are dramatic drawings of colossal dimensions across the desert and there are uh, strange tracings. Like here's, here's these, these, there's more than 1,300 triangles, trapezoids, and lines from 800 BC, 300 BC to 800 AD. I've flown over it. I wrote a book about this stuff. Here there are laser straight lines, some of them more than 25 kilometers. They cover the natural curvature of the earth. When it comes to a hill, it'll start precisely on the other side. Uh, it's very strange enigmas. But at all these 1,300, you'll see that there's more than 70 great gigantic glyphs of different animals. And, not, and Ica stones are found within a 150 mile region and, and also in the Nazca Valley. The Pampa there uh, is about 550 square kilometers and there's the Pampa lines and the Nazca lines and then there's about 70 gigantic glyphs like there's a, a Pelican, it's like 800, 900 meters long. There is the animal, there's dogs, there's hummingbirds. And most of these are Inca gods and Nazca gods. They built them for the bee offerings in the sky, but there's other reasons why they built them. Here's the hummingbird that's about 900 meters. This is the rarest of all spiders, or ancient spider. It uh, lives in the caves in the Amazon. This one's about 50 meters long. It's drawn anatomically accurate on the desert. And in there, it's blind. It doesn't have eyes. And in 1959, a biologist at uh, Boston University was using a high-powered microscope. This is about a little larger than the dot at the end of a sentence. This species of spider is blind and lives in caves. And he discovered that this third leg on the right-hand side under a microscope, it was a pertussible tube that expanded. It was used for sex, but it was also used, here's a spermator at the end, that's what they believe this is here, and also it was used as a drinking tube. Oh, that's strange. Okay, so it had these no eyes, and the Noskins drew it accurately uh, according to these people on, on the desert. They drew the condors. I've seen a lot of condors up in the Andes. Been, within a couple of feet of them. Uh, here's the ancient hairless dog done by uh, the Noskins, and they still have that same dog today. Here is a dinosaur that's about 75 meters long on the hillside that's part of the Nazca lines. We find stones in the tombs, and then we find that Nazca 
And the head archaeologist who has a PhD from Moscow University, when I was interviewed, he, he called me Dennis the First because I pointed out about three of these that hadn't been noted. And I flew for hours on end with Eduardo Haran. Uh, and other people had seen them, they just hadn't made the connection. All right. Now, this is up at Papa, and flying over, this is almost 50 meters long, and it has a head crest back, and then it has horns here, and then down here, a distincti. I'm going to point it out. You look closer, closer. We measured in the horns and everything, and it's similar to stylized, but it looks somewhat like a Strirocosaurus. 300 BC, approximately. This is a Noskin vase. It's authentic. It's worth a lot of money. I happen to possess that one, too. But anyway, you'll see this here. And it's a dinosaur that is very much like a Strirocosaurus. Here's the Ica stone with a Strirocosaurus on it. Here's another stone with a similar Strirocosaurus type dinosaur on it from 100 AD. Here's a Noskin vase with a Strirocosaurus about 600 AD. All right. Remember the night Jesus was brutally betrayed and 500 soldiers from the Antonio Fortress, they came with their torches flaming like liquid fire streaming down the hillside, blazing as they crossed the Kidron Valley. And they came into the Garden of Gethsemane and they burst through the trees and they surrounded the Lord of Glory. And Peter grabbed the Roman soldier's sword and he tried to cut off Malchus's, the high priest Caiaphas' servant's head, but he missed it, cut off his ear. And so Jesus reached down and put his ear back on. Every time Malchus would ever look at his reflection in a mirror or a pool of water, he would remember Jesus as Lord. Every time Caiaphas, the high priest, would look at Malchus and see his ear, he would remember Jesus as Lord. Every time the Roman soldiers would see Malchus, who was there that night, they know Jesus is Lord. Pontius Pilate runs into Malchus. He would see and he would know Jesus is Lord. Here's the God I know. He always leaves a Malchus's ear. In everybody's life, in your family, wherever it is, he always leaves evidence. Where would it be the best place for God to deposit some of this evidence? The driest place on the planet, the Altacama Desert, which within 150 or 200 miles, you'll be deep in the Amazon, in the jungle, which I think there are a few dinosaurs might still live there. There was some ankylosaurs spotted just about four years ago. These natives talked about and described them as they came down by the river. The Amazon itself, just the Amazon jungle, is larger than the United States. So I think something could hide there. But here's a Strirocosaurus. I believe that this evidence is, is always left by God. And... Um, for future, and this may be the best time with these museums being built. You see this, uh, what are those, can you see? Those are pyramids buried in the desert near Nazca at uh, Cotahuasi. And they're almost the size of the pyramids. Here's the, uh, the pyramids in Giza. They were not made out of stone, but they were made out of hard brick mud. So 400 plus meters high. Here it is, one of the Giza pyramids. Here's some of the stuff that shows the overcast. Here's the way they believe they look. They're trying to excavate them now. It's, it's out in the middle of no place. So here's, while well, they were excavating partially in 1959, this is a Harango wood totem pole-like thing. And there's a bunch of them out there, but some of them were carved. And you see closely here, can you see something carved on this, this totem pole? Now, if you know anything about a wood, it takes a long, 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 long time for it to dry out and crack and look like this. But also it was found in an excavation in 1959 by the archaeologists. See this? There's a dinosaur on it. It looks similar to Edmontosaurus. It's right here. Head, the head goes around over here, back. Back, tail, so forth. And then the Harango wood post. I'm finished. Did I finish in time? Any question real quick?
We got time for a question or are we through? We could probably take one. Let me bring the microphone okay. around, sir. Just one question. Second. We'll just, yeah, I think we're, uh, okay. we're a little Ask bit over schedule question. already. Not quit. Hang on, hang on. What? S sir, I got to put a microphone on you. And so what are these sources questions. for my pictures? What are these sources for, this, uh, for those pictures well, that, that you show? I take most of the pictures about the Ica dinosaur and stones and stuff myself. Uh -huh. But the text and the material is like from Dr. Lawrence Whitmore, who did the study of the noses, and the man at the Smithsonian, who, who's not currently in the Smithsonian, he's another institution, and other experts are the ones who, who gave me the information. Because I'm not a dinosaur expert. But over time, I've, I've also collected what other people said about the Ica stones. And I knew the major players involved uh, in this thing over the last quarter of a century. All right, thanks. Question, how yes, sir. are the stones and the artifacts, the pots and so forth, dated? Okay, first of all, when you go to a cemetery there in that area, you know approximately what the Nazcan civilization was, okay? From about 300 BC to 900 AD. But important in that is the way they did their pottery. All the different civilizations down there, the Mochi, the Nazca, they did their pottery very distinctively, unmistakably. It's just as much as like the Anastasi pottery in the American Southwest. Now, you can do some thermoluminescent testing, some of that, and also, when you do the top of the, of the wood, of when you break into the tomb, they do, the, 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 I can't pronounce exactly the way the word is pronounced, but you could do some C14 tests like that, also the way the ceramics are. And also, we can't make those ceramics the same way today. I want to point that out. And they use a different chemical, pro the, the, the material they use and the thinness of it. The best pottery makers can't make them, so they cannot be faked. I can show that over and over again. But after a while, you know the cemeteries, you know the civilization, and of course, they could be off a little bit here and there, but it's close to that proximity. All right, Thank thanks. you, Dr. Swift. We appreciate it.